أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا بن القاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين أما بعد قال الله الحكيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والشمس وضحاها ونقمر إذا تلاها صدق الله العلي العظيم Our nights are slowly coming to an end with two days remaining before Arbain it is now the time to give allegiance to not just Sayyidu Shuhada but also to the Master of the Times Imam Mahdi Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Fawajah Sharif Therefore fitting today is the fact that it's a Thursday night and as per narrations on that Thursday night we're awaiting Despite the many signs that you may see before the coming of the 12th Imam, each one of us lives in hope from the sayings of the Ayman alayhi salam that every Thursday sincerely wait for the coming of that Mahdi. It's a reality. In fact, today the world is crying out for a savior. You look around the world, what do you see? Torment, people in trouble, people with problems. If it's not world problems, it's family problems. individual problems in the last couple of nights we've seen how easily we're not at peace all of those things that we should be eliminating in our life that removes peace and tranquility from our lives is about today within our lives sin grudges gossip backbiting all of these things that destroy us and you look today and you find within our communities wherever they may be all over the world to the extent that that saying of the prophet is true today if it wasn't yesterday the prophet of god said islam was founded gharib lonely had no followers if you look at it for the first 3 years the prophet was in taqiya only 40 followers later 3 years later did he openly declare islam and in this way he says that before the end of time mosques may be full you may have massive mosques you may have a big community but there's a reality islam will be gari because you'll find no one to practically implement the tenets of islam we need 40 people we need 40 people to do dua that's that night today it's a holy night imagine this you're sitting today at a point in history think about it deeply let's say for example if we sincerely were to pray tonight 40 of us in fact there's probably hundreds of us sitting here today hundreds of us if each one of us was to pray for the coming of that imam tonight each one of us tears in our eyes to say look time is up now we've suffered a lot it's been 1400 years in fact humanity from the very beginning has been suffering waiting for a savior to come how about you come back tonight how about a fajr time when we wake up that voice comes from mecca to say the mahdi is here ya ahl al alam he's here why don't you come now and serve him it's not something that the muslims have been waiting for if you look throughout history you find that every single religion every single nation has been waiting for that figure let's look at this tonight then let's see to give us more iman the fact that all of the other faiths have been waiting for that person to come look at all of the world's major religions each one of them is looking or waiting for the mahdi we call him the mahdi they may call him something else in logic they say that sometimes you find the description being the same but the name or the title being different if you look at the description from all of the ancient religions each one of them describes the mahdi you call him the mahdi they call him the awaited one they call him the messiah they call him something else they call him the reincarnation of vishnu they may call him the final avatar whatever they call him the reality is that each religion each denomination is waiting for the coming of a hero 
somebody to save the world. It's part of our fitra. Look today and see if you study those people who have studied sociology. When human beings are being oppressed, they're waiting. What gives them hope? That a person will come and save us. On the one hand is that mentality of us, that we've been oppressed, we're suffering, the world is suffering today. Maybe somebody will come and save us. That's within our psyche. But at the same time, you find that it's transcendent. It's in all religions, and the description is the very same thing. Islam, which grew up in the Middle East, when you look at those traditions in Far East, in China, you find the very same traditions apparent. The world is waiting. Go back to the oldest tradition. What do you see? Let's look at Hinduism. In the very same thing they say. They say that the tenth reincarnation, the Aveta, the tenth reincarnation of Brahma will come forward. Reincarnation? Islam doesn't nullify all forms of reincarnation. It only nullifies one of them. There are four types of reincarnation. One of them is not jais within Islam. Ayatollah Abdi was sitting there in Qum giving a lesson on this particular thing. He says, listen, that which is mashur, that reincarnation, that's haram. That was something that we don't believe in. But there are other forms of carnation. For example, when you go into Barzakh and you turn into an animal, that's reincarnation of a type. The reincarnation that we disallow is the one that says that you go to perfection and you're destroyed and you go back to zero again. So when the Hindus here talk about reincarnation, they've forgotten the essence of what the meaning was. And this is why we say Hinduism was a religion for the elite. Islam is a religion for the world. In Hinduism, what they're trying to say, which has been translated wrongly, is that when the manifestation of Brahma comes forward, what is Imam Mehdi? Go to the narration of the sixth Imam, alayhi salam. When the Aima say, Nahnu Asmail Husna, we are the beautiful names of Allah, it is a manifestation of God that we're looking at. When you talk about that individual who is coming within Hindu traditions, if the aim of that individual to spread love, peace, justice in the world, if these are those characteristics. What they're saying is that a perfect man will come. What is the perfect man? The perfect man is a person who is perfect to his capacity. The perfect man is a person who manifests the entire universe in his heart. When the Hindus talk about the manifestation of the universe in the heart of their deities, they're wrong in that sense that they've broken them up to deities. We say that that person is the perfect man. Al-Insan al-Kamil, the prophet of God, who is the highest level of perfection, is the one that the entire universe is reflected out of his heart. If all of the names and the attributes of Allah are scattered in the world, the heart of the perfect man is where everything comes into unity. That heart, according to Islamic tradition, is Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The final manifestation of the Prophet, he himself is saying, Awwaluna Muhammad, Akhiruna Muhammad, Awsatuna Muhammad, Kullana Muhammad. Final one, he says. He says that the final one, his name is my name. His title is my name. His qualities are my qualities. Look at the narration and you'll see. What does the final one have? The final one invites the people like the Prophet invited. He has hilm, he has shuja, he has sabr, he has all of the characteristics of the 12 imams. Just as the final prophet encompasses all of the essences of all of the 124,000 prophets. This is the warith of all of the 12 imams. In fact, just when you recite, and today you recited the same thing, when you talk about Sayyid al-Shuhada, you say, As-salamu alayka ya warith Adam, from that Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, he is the successor to all of those prophets. And in the same way, the Mahdi is the successor to Sayyid al-Shuhada alayhi salam. In this way, when you look at Hindu tradition, sometimes it needs to be interpreted. Go into the multiplicity and take the Tawheed out of it. They're waiting for a person to come. His description is exactly that of the Imam. What does he do? Peace, justice, removing suffering. But let's not just stop there. Why is it that Hindu scriptures was deteriorated? Why is it that it finished? Because it was for an elite class. And the other classes, when they converted it within their language, they went towards polytheism. Look into the Vedas today. Go today and study the Adivaita Vedanta. You find everything there is Tawheed. Nothing there is multiplicity. It was as if they were being inspired by someone. It's a reality. 
they talk about God and in fact today when we go into the Gita Ayatollah Abadi says he says the haqiqat Muhammadiyah is found within Krishna's saying and the haqiqat Alawiyah is found within the sayings of Arjun and the haqiqat Fatimiyah is found within the Bhagavan Gita but you need an eye to open you need to go deeper inside don't look at the Vahiri side go deep inside and you'll find Tawheed even within those scriptures Allah doesn't say that we didn't guide a nation every nation was guided everything was there we need to go deeper and understand it yes we can't call them Ahlul Kitab because our research hasn't gone that far yet to prove them but the reality is when you look into their scriptures and there are many experts in India who can establish that awaited one the one who is all praised do you know the meaning of Muhammad? the one who is continuously all praised they can find that Mubaraka who is Mubaraka? according to the narrations one of the names of Fatima is Mubaraka you can find that within the scriptures go inside and look so you see that person who opens their eyes they see your reality before the end of time there will be a, a person coming forward he will be the reincarnation I he will be the manifestation he will be Nur and Imam Mahdi is also Nur today when the world talks about the Mahdi they become scared because they think doomsday is coming I said wow stand outside with a placard 2012 world's gonna end why? It's the mentality. So you know what they do? Go and look at the news. You know whenever certain political figures raise Imam Mahdi, right? You find in the translation they cut everything out and the last thing that they say, oh he's the final awaited one. Why? So that people don't understand. Today in the press, in the western world, they link two people together. Destruction of the world, Imam Mahdi. But when you look at the essence of Imam Mahdi, he's not here for a third world war my friends. This is the negative concept. A war doesn't need to happen. The purpose of the Imam? To spread perfection. That's his purpose. Why isn't the Imam coming therefore? Why? Because mankind isn't ready for him. What does it mean to be ready? Let me give you an example. You go to the gym. You're thinking to yourself, you know what? Arnold Schwarzenegger eats your heart out. 22 inch biceps coming my way. The reality is at the moment you've got a 9 inch bicep. You've heard that Arnold Schwarzenegger pumps 120 kilos. You go and try and lift that up, you're going to guillotine yourself. They're going to say, look, you're stupid. Start off with 10 first. Then build up to 20, 30. Give it a couple of years and you'll be able to do 120. Us as humanity are still on that 30, my friends. We want to press 120. What is the purpose of the Mehdi? The purpose of the Mehdi is to take humanity to its final perfection. It isn't what you see in the world it isn't the fact that there is torment in the world the fact that there is natural disasters in the world yes there may be all of these things but they're there to wake you up to say to you prepare yourself what does preparation mean preparation according to the Mehdi is what intellectually you become the best when you're intellectually there and you get to the highest level then you say Mehdi take us that one space forward it's like when you've taken all of the proteins that you can do and then you take a bit of protein shake to just to finish off to get those lean muscles but at least you're eating right if you're not eating right and you take protein shake what's gonna happen you're gonna get flabby the aim is in there in the same way you're waiting for the Mahdi to come. Mahdi takes society to its perfection. In all of these lectures we've looked at, if you go to Hinduism, you find it was for the elite, only spiritual. Go to the Taoism, same thing. Confucianism, same thing. It didn't appeal to material world. It was only spirit. Let's go to Judaism and what do you see? In Judaism you see Moses coming forward. The purpose of Moses? To emancipate a nation that was already in slavery. So what did he do? He took Bani Israel, the Jewish nation, which was being oppressed completely, and he took him out, and then what did he need to do? He freed him. Now what? You don't have society, no social laws, nothing to govern yourself, no system. So he produced a physical system for them to live, and necessitated them for Jesus to come forward. Why? Because when Jesus saw that the Jewish rabbis were becoming fundamentalist, and they were using deen for their own profit, he had to come forward and tell the world the spirit of the law. So what's that telling you? Every prophet had a particular aim. It's not the fact that Moses wasn't spiritual. It's because the need of the time necessitated a law to be made. 
Islam when it came forward everything was in place the Prophet finally now took you towards perfection if you were to apply everything within Islam you'd be a perfect person so why has it been 1400 years 1400 years because we're unable to apply it but the Prophet of God said the most or well, this is me saying the most important thing for the Muslims is to better their akhlaq to get munazzam, to get organized. Why? Because if you look at the message of the Prophet, he's known for his akhlaq. He's known for somebody to establish something. Let me give you an example. And do you know why Allah waited 40 years before declaring the Prophet the Prophet? Yahya, six months old. And Jesus, speaking from the grave. Other Prophets, 10 years old, 15 years old. Nuh, Yaqub, Yusuf, Prophet, young age. Why did Allah deem it necessary to wait for 40 years before declaring the final Prophet? Isn't the final Prophet the perfect, the most perfect of all the Prophets? So why is it that Jesus is speaking from the, gra from the cradle? Why is it the fact that you're finding a Prophet at the age of 30 becoming a Prophet, and then you find our Prophet? Fine, we say all Prophets are Prophets from birth, but why did Allah wait until 40? You know why? It's very simple. You know the purpose of the Prophet? To establish a world system. To establish any system. Confucius is a very beautiful thing. In China, he comes to one of the leaders and he says to them, Listen, if you want to become strong, if you want to become powerful, there are three things that you have to do. Number one, feed the people. If the people are fed, they'll follow you. Number two, give them weapons. Let them be able to defend themselves. Thirdly, win their trust. If they trust you, they'll support you. And then he says, if you can't give them weapons to protect themselves, feed their stomachs. But if you can't do that, make sure you have their trust. Now you understand Sayyidu Shuhada. Three days hunger, no water, no food, no weapons. Three days later, every single one of them was still saying, Labbaika Ya Hussein. Why? Because he'd won their trust. Now understand, 40 years later, why is it that the Prophet was declared the Prophet? Because he was known for two things, a sadiq and al-Amin. These are those two fundamental things which are needed to establish any system. If the people trust you, then only then can you establish a government. If this is why Allah waited for 40 years, one of the reasons we say. So that people understood and trusted him. They understood his social system, social status, two characteristics. If you want to establish any society, any government, if you want to be the prime minister, if the people trust you, and if the people see you as a person who's truthful, they'll submit to you. This is why Allah waited. That day came. The Prophet of God now has been told to declare Islam. He comes out. He says to the Kuffar, he says, Kuffar, come out, I want to speak to you. He says, if I told you behind Abu Qabais there was an army, what would you say? They say, Amanna wa salamna. We'd submit to you, we'd believe you. He says, say if you decided to go behind and you realized there wasn't. They say, Muhammad would say, we're blind. But you're truthful. Because we've seen 40 years of your life and we've seen you being truthful and trustworthy. This is where Allah wanted to take that nation to. And so then after that they said, the declaration came, I declare there is no God but God, and I am that prophet of God. You know what they said? Finance. Said we believe in one God, our pockets are going to be cut. Which was basically the summary. Don't we see that today? Our brothers from all over the world, they come and say, look, we need some money for our centers. What do we say? Not we, but generally. We say, we'll give you our life, but we won't give you our purse. Life is for you, but money stays in the bank. Interest is coming in. It is good. This is what happens. Our purpose, nevertheless, to be able to become Muslim so that we can submit everything for the sake of Allah. Forty years to establish a system. That system was then established. When that system was finally established, the purpose of that you see, spirituality or Islam, spirituality doesn't mean going into a cave and saying, Allahu, Allahu, doesn't get you anywhere. It may get you somewhere, but it won't get you the final level. We're human beings. Human beings means that we're multiplicity. Social life with your friends, with your family, with your parents. All of these things have rights. This is why Imam Zain al Abidin has emphasized. Allah. 
In this way, he's emphasized those rights. Why? Because he wants to make you into a human being. A human being is a person who, in all of the different fields of your life, to be a good husband is Islam. To be a good father is Islam. To give charity and to help the poor is Islam. To help the maqsad of Imam Mahdi, that's Islam. To be a good businessman, that's Islam. Everything is Islam. Life is Islam. This is why Islam has said, if you want to be spiritual, if you want to get to the final levels of spirituality, you need to be like the Prophet of God. Live amongst the people, but be your heart with Allah. In this way, you're doing everything for the sake of Allah. So when the Imam comes, humanity needs to say, look, we're intellectually trying the best that we can try. And socially, we're reforming ourselves. And spiritually, we're doing all of our prayers and praying those Salatul levels and repenting for our sins. When every single faculty of our society and our personal life, when we're maxing that, then we can say, lifting up our hands to Allah, say, now send the Mahdi. We don't have any more capacity now. Now we need him to take us that step forward. Then Allah will send that man to come. When he comes, it will be the most Nurani moment for the world. On two levels, there has to be perfection. Us as a society and as an individual, but the world needs to perfect itself. Look at the narration and you see, when the Mahdi comes, the ground will cough up all of its jewelry, all of its ornaments, all of those things which are perfect. perfect pur purpose of that? To also take the world towards perfection. Everything is going, stone has its perfection, tree has its perfection, world has its perfection. The whole world needs to go to its perfection before the Mahdi comes. Or when the Mahdi comes before the Day of Judgment comes. First religion, Hinduism. Go to the other one and see. Taoism. You know what Taoism says? It says the purpose now for final cycle of reincarnation, that final cycle is there to alleviate suffering. What is the purpose of the Mahdi? If every single one of us are suffering today, and you are looking inside it, you see yourself, someone, someone are suffering more, other people less. You feel pain in your body, suffering, right? You had an argument with your wife, suffering. Musiba comes, you're crying for your own pity sometimes. Some people are not, or everybody. You know, you get the odd person who's like, you know, that was a brilliant Masaib. All the pressure that I had the last two nights, everything came out in five minutes. We were crying for us, so sometimes look at your fate. Sometimes I look at my fate and I think, what have I done in these last couple of years? Have I served the Mahdi properly? Tears come into your eyes sometimes. Why? He's waiting to come back. Islam is the antidote for cancer. If that antidote is deprived from us, you find that we are people who are mujrim, we are sinners. We're holding that back. If today the Mahdi is coming for what purpose? To cure the illnesses of society. If he's being held back, you know what's happening? Problem? Think about it. Then Allah says, He says, look, if you don't buck up your ideas, I'll make another nation who will come and serve the Mahdi. Let's be that nation who serves him. Next religion. Christianity. Christianity is waiting for Isa alayhi salam to come. We're waiting for Isa alayhi salam to come. This is where you find tandem. But you know what the most interesting religion out of all of these are? Judaism. You know why? Because when Judaism speaks on Messianism, it speaks on three different levels. And it's unbelievable because sometimes we can parallel it with Islam. Sometimes, honestly, when you think about it, you think the closest religion to us is actually Judaism. It's amazing. They talk about three levels of Messianism. One level of Messianism, according to Judaism, is this. That whenever the Jewish nation were in problems, a person would come. The purpose of that person? To save the Jewish nation. I'll give you an example. David. He came to save that nation. Solomon, savior of that nation. Moses, savior of the nation. That means that within every generation or every hundred years, two hundred years, one thousand years, whenever the Jewish community or whenever the community is in problems, you find a person rises to save that nation. Now let's go deeper and see. Second reason, they say, second thing. They say that Messianism, Mehdiism is a system. Today when we talk about the system of Dajjal, some of us say it's a person, some of us say it's a system. The argument is this, my friends. Dajjal can be a person and it can be a system as well. Just as Yazid is a system and Hussein is a system. Yazid is a system which means what? Oppression. Dhulm. Hussein is a system which says freedom, liberties, peace, 
worshipping God. Tawheed. That's the system. The system of the Dajjal has two qualities. You see, the difference today between Sufiani and Dajjal is what? We find amongst our Sunni brothers there is no system of Sufiani. We have a system of Sufiani. Sufiani comes with a sword. The purpose of Sufiani? To kill people. To cause bloodshed. Saddam was an open enemy. He killed people. You knew the enemy. But you find another country that comes forward and says, I'm your friend. I've come to save you. Let me suck out your oil as well. He's your enemy in that respect. He's taking your natural resources. All of those artifacts that you've had for the last 5,000 years from Babylonian history is found in the, in the museums. It was in Baghdad and it's somewhere else now. Allah knows where it is now. This is the Dajjal. The Dajjal comes as your friend. When Abu Sufyan was the enemy of Islam, it was apparent. He's Abu Sufyan, Badr, Uhud. But when Abu Sufyan became a Muslim and he became a Munafiq, you can't tell then. The biggest enemy therefore, enemy from within, the Munafiq from within. You can't tell your enemy. And in this way the reality is this. Dajjal, he is your friend. I've come to reform you. I've come to help you. What does he do? Stab you in the back. Two qualities of the Dajjal. You know what those two qualities are? Let me tell you in the narration it says. And I'm going to break it down into English, into our way of understanding. Number one, shahwa. Number two, music. What does that mean? Give you an example. A Gillette sensor advert comes on. Purpose of Gillette sensor? Shave your beard. I'm not promoting shaving beard, by the way. There's a particular narration that talks about that. Imam Zain al Abidin al Islam says. My Shias, they don't do three things. One of them is they don't shave. Put that to one side. Gillette Sensor advert comes on. What do you find? You find a half naked woman and a music in the background. It appeals to your shahwa. System of the Dajjal. Go into any shop, music. The argument isn't halal music and haram music. Go back to your maraji, refer to them, find out what halal is and haram is. But look, music. Today, everyone is numb because of the celebrity culture. You know exactly what's happening in Cannes and Hollywood than you do what's happening in Karbala. Not you guys, but generally the society. You open up a newspaper, thousands of people are dying in the world, what do you find? Brad Pitt's just had a falling out with his missus and it's made the front line news. Fifteen magazines are published straight away. You know what, four years of marriage has come to an end. It's been 18 months, it's come to an end. Celebrity culture, why? And what are these celebrities? Every single page you find half naked. Either you find a six pack poking out, or you find something else poking out. It's disgusting, and everything is music. And what develops? Those musicians now. That's our celebrity culture. That's the way of numbing things. Ask a person, do you know what's happening in Afghanistan? Do you know what happened in Mazar Sharif? No. Do you know what happened in the newspapers? It was, yeah, yeah. David Beckham got a new tattoo. And do you know that Armani's, wow, love his boxes. That's what's happening. It's a reality. Look at the people outside. It's not a joke. You take it as a joke. It's a reality. The average person outside has no idea what's happening in the world. But he knows exactly where music and nafs is. The jal comes. He appeals to your nafs. He hits your nafs. He appeals to that. But you know what else he appeals to? He numbs you. The purpose of hitting your nafs? That you go into sensual pleasures. You can't go even without half an hour without listening to a tune. You wake up in the morning and you want to switch on something. You know the reality of that? He wants to numb you. The purpose of Islam? To remove that numbness, to take you towards the reality, the haqqaiq. This is what's important for us. It's what we need to understand. So think to yourself, it's not about the Dajjal being here or not. Ask yourself, is the system of the Dajjal in play? Well, I don't know, you tell me. If it is in play, be very careful. In the narration it says, people were asking for alamat as zuhur right? We're going to mention so many people have probably attended those 12 lectures that I've given over the last couple of years on alamat as zuhur so I want to give something different, not repeating any of those 12. According to a particular narration it says, you'll wake up in the morning, you go out of your house, your iman will falter, when you come back your iman is gone. Yesterday I was going to UCL or sitting with a Muslim in his car, he wasn't one of us, but he said, my son, he went in the morning, he was a practicing Muslim, he came back at night time, he'd become an atheist. Ajib. Things like that are taking place. 
you think of it as a joke, but we're finding denominations, this is taking place within them. Why? Because they don't have Sayyid al-Shuhada as an institution. These are the problems which are taking place today within Islam. What is our purpose therefore? Our purpose is to identify this. What is the best way of tackling the Dajjal? Sayyid al-Shuhada tells us. You know what he says? When his head was cut off and put on a spear, you know what he was reciting? Surah Kaf. According to the narrations it says, if you want to protect yourself from Dajjal, recite Surah Kaf. It's as easy as that. Why say the Shuhada reciting the Surah? Has anybody ever thought about it? He could be reciting a hundred other ones. He's reciting this. He's reciting this and giving a message. There are a number of stories in Surah Kaf. You know the purpose of Surah Kaf is what? To take that lessons from it. I'll give you the biggest lesson in there, or many lessons, but one of the lessons. Dhulqarnain is a holy man. If Dhulqarnain was to lift up his hands, Allah would listen to him. But Dhulqarnain doesn't come by magic changes of system. He says, you know what? The latest technology of your time, the latest perfection of your time, is iron. Build your wall yourself, then I'll pray for you, I'll help you. Convert that message today, the Mahdi. Be the best that you can be, the Mahdi will help you. That's the second pillar of Judaism, Messianism. Third pillar, that at the end of time a Mahdi figure will come. All of the main world religions, if there's some I've missed out, I apologize. But if we looked at all of the main world religions, Eastern and Western religions, what we're finding is that each one of them is going towards a Messianic figure, the coming of a Mahdi. So let's now go and see what this Mahdi does. Let's have a last salwa, please. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Time is flying. Forty minutes have just flown by. I feel I've just started an introduction. But you know what? We have two more nights remaining. The ninth Imam alayhi salam states. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The ninth Imam says. There's particular narrations about the Mahdi. Now you find very few narrations from the ninth Imam. One of the reasons was of his situation. But he talks about the Mahdi. In the narration he says the Mahdi is like two things. Ponder over this. He says the Mahdi is like Yusuf alayhi salam. You know why? Because Yusuf was with his brothers, socializing with his brothers, chilling out with his brothers. But you know what happened? His brothers didn't realize he was with them. Ghaibah doesn't mean that the Imam has disappeared. It means he could be sitting here, socializing with you. You wouldn't have a clue who the Imam is. That's the Imam al Islam. Like Yusuf. But it's a second narration that I want to see. Ninth Imam al Islam again says, He says the Mahdi is also like Musa al Islam. Why? Look at the narration. Musa is sent away. Ten years he spends with Shoaib. Gets married. Is now coming back. You see, Musa at this stage was a Nabi, but he wasn't a Rasul. There's different characteristics. A Rasul is a person who Allah says, take the message, go to the people. At the moment, he hadn't had the ability or the opportunity by God. He's in the forest. He goes to sleep at the time of Maghrib. In the middle of the night, he's awoken. The burning bush issue happens. Take off your shoes, Moses, come in. Fajr time comes. He's given the decree, go to Pharaoh. In the narration it says, it will be night time. The Mahdi will go to sleep. For example, tonight, it's Maghrib time, Isha time. Mahdi is going to sleep. Fajr time, a voice comes. Mahdi, it's time now. Dhuhr. In the narration it says the Mahdi comes. He comes to Mecca. On the one hand you have Hajr Aswad, on the other one Maqam Ibrahim. And now he says, come and give me Bayya. Puts his hand out. The first person to come, a white dove comes from the sky, sits on his hand, gives allegiance. Who is that? In Jibrail. Then the Mahdi says, 25 things you promise me, and I promise that I'll go forward and I'll fill the world with truth and justice. This is the Mahdi. Straight away, in a blink of an eye, 40 people come. There are two ways, two companions of the Mahdi. One who will come instantaneously. Why? Because they have the power of Dayul Ard. In a second they will be there. But the narration goes forward. It says that there will be other people who will be flying in the air. It will take him a long time to come. I.e. 
let's say it's aeroplanes, for example. But there's more thawab for them because they're going out of their way. They don't have these powers, you see. They can't levitate. Other people can. They're not knocking out those liquors that we were talking about yesterday. But anyhow, so they say two people will come. Nevertheless, no one thing that there are 360 people living at the moment who are in direct contact with the Imam. We don't know them. When one dies, Allah replaces them with another person. Let me give you an example. In the time of Ayatollah al-Qasim al-Khui, he had a friend. Both of them in Azerbaijan, both of them were leaving. He was coming to Najaf, his friend was going to Tabriz. In Tabriz, there's a masjid over there, Masjid Khan. There's a Madrasa Khan as well. So you know, Tabriz is an area which most of the time is very cold. This guy goes and he starts his Madrasa. This guy now narrates. He says, when I started the Madrasa, there used to be a guy who used to sweep up. Call him the Muki, right? His job was sleeping, uh, sweeping up the orchard, taking water. And in those days, the Muki had a very tough job. He'd have to fill up the containers for when somebody went to the toilet, especially if it was winter. And so people obviously would cuss him. You know how it is, we look down upon people. In this way, people look down upon him. This guy's saying it came to winter and it's freezing cold. And he's saying I was lying then. You know, sometimes in winter it's cold, right? And you need to go to the toilet. And it's one o'clock and you're thinking, man, I don't want to get out of bed. And it's absolutely freezing and you're thinking, okay, I'll wait for half an hour and I'll wait for an hour or more. And then it gets to a stage where you're about to burst, but you're lying there and you're thinking, man, it's freezing. And the smiles are telling me that it's happened to most of you guys. And so then you think, okay, forget it, man. Let me get up and go to the toilet because I can't take it anymore. And you get up and it's cold and you're like, wow, it's freezing. Either it's going to come out here, let me leg it to the toilet. And he says, I did the same thing and I was legging it to the toilet. Now he says that the toilet was such that the toilet was here and this guy's khadim, muki, whatever you call him, his room was next door. There's no window in his room, by the way. There's only a door. He goes, as I was going, I was bursting anyway, but I saw there was a light coming from his room. And I was thinking, what's that light? He goes, anyhow, just as he was, he went to the toilet and he was a bit nosy, so he left the door open. Slightly open, so he's in the toilet, but he wants to see exactly who's coming out. Because, you know, you find people who are nosy, right? So he says, no one's coming out. And he gets up and he knocks on the door. The light disappears. Moki comes out. He says, can I help you? He says, man, I was listening to you talking. He goes, I swear there was someone in there. He says, man, there's no one there. He goes, honestly, there was someone in there. He says, no, honestly, there's no one. He says, can I check? He says, yeah, by all means, comes and checks. He goes, listen, you know what? I can swear that there was a light here. There was a person here. He begs. He says, you know, qasam this, qasam that. Wallahi this, wallahi that. Eventually, the guy says, all right, let me tell you what. He goes, I was a master of the times. Imam Mehdi, ajjalallahu ta'ala faraj al-sharif. He says, wow. He says, why? What's the story? He says, we are one of those 360 guys who helped the Mahdi. He goes, afterwards, my heart felt so bad when people used to disturb him, when they would insult him, when they would say things to him. Eventually, this person was watching me. He realized I'm not going to be able to take it anymore. One day, he went into the Sahan after prayers and he disappeared for good, never to be seen in Tabriz again. There are people like that in this world living. Understand, they do the work of the Imam a.s. They're different from the 313. They're different from the 40 people. Who are 313? 313 are generals of Imam Mahdi. Their purpose, when the Mahdi comes, the world will be separated into 313 states. Each state is one of these boys. That's the purpose of these 313. 40 people, don't we have 40 good people? How many mujtahids do we have? How many maraja do we have? People ask, man, all these mujtahids, all these ulama, don't we have 40 good people? You know what the criteria is, my friend. I remember I asked one of my teachers. I said, look, why doesn't the Mahdi come? He says, look into a telescope. I looked. He says, can you see the things magnifying? I said, yes. You know that this, he says to me, you know that there's so many lenses. When the light hits the right place, when it refracts, then you can see it. If all of these lenses were blurred, you wouldn't be able to see anything. I said, yes. He said, therefore, there's a secret behind there. He says that in these 40 men, there has to be a portion of women and a portion of children as well. When all of these, like a combination, 
comes together, then the Mahdi comes. Even if there's 1,000 good women, the combination isn't correct. Even if there's 1,000 good men, the combination isn't correct. The combination has to be correct for the Imam to come. The world is a world of causality, my friends. Causality necessitates that the combination is right. This is the Mahdi. Time is flying. I've been given free rain to speak as long as I want, but you know what? I'm looking at you guys. And even though you're sitting quietly, but I don't want to tire you out, and I want to leave you in suspense for tomorrow as well. Asalwat, please. So in this way you see the concept of the Mahdi, the purpose of the Mahdi, enlightenment. There are people out there in control. We've mentioned Sayyid Ali Qadhi. Let me give you one story about him then. Afterwards you can see yourself. Are you prepared for the Mahdi or not? And then after that we'll go towards Dua. The purpose that we're here. Sayyid Ali Qadhi, famous Arif. We've discussed him over the last nine, ten days. There was a student of his by the name of Sayyid Hassan Masqati. Sayyid Hassan Masqati is one of his best students. He's buried in Hyderabad, India. Sayyid Ali Qadhi sent him there. He saw that there were Hindu mystics over there. He said, go and count to them. Sometimes you do tabligh with the word. Sometimes you do tabligh with spirituality. Anyhow, he's buried in Hyderabad. He's one of the top students. Isfahani Masqati. Sayyid Hassan Masqati comes to Ali Qadhi one day. He says, Sayyidna, I want to see an istikhara. Can you see me in istikhara? He says, young man, you've been in Najaf for how many years? And you don't know how to do an istikhara? He looks up at him and he says, no, I want a special istikhara. You know, that special one that you're passing down to the ulama have. <laughs> Sayyid Ali Qadhi smiles. He says, you want a special one? He says, yes. He says, let me give you a dhikr. Go to Masjid al-Sahla for 40 days. Do that. You'll meet the imam himself. You can ask him. He says, wow, okay. He goes to Masjid al-Sahla and he begins to recite whatever the dhikr was. One day goes, two day goes, thirty day goes. On the fortieth day, said Hassan and Masqati says, now when did Qadhi die? 1955. So this is not an old story. Said Hassan and Masqati now says, I was sitting there. A man comes to me, shakes my shoulder, says, get ready, the Mahdi is coming. He says, my entire essence shook. He says, I was shaking, I couldn't believe it. He says, I wasn't ready, I wasn't prepared. I was like, Mahdi is coming. He turns around and he says, please tell him, don't do the zahma to come. I really want to see you, but I'm not ready to see you. He says, you're sure? 40 days you've been doing this zikr. He says, yes, I can't, I can't face him. The man goes. Masqati gets up, goes towards Najaf again. Gadi standing there, looks at him and he says, if you didn't have the ability to take it, why did you ask me for it? Look inside of yourself and see. If the Mahdi was to come today, would you be ready for him? Let me give you another story. Gadi is walking through the city of Najaf. As he walks, a man comes. He says, Gadi, that dhikr that you gave me, did you give me it or the Imam? Gadi looks up at him and he says, this guy is being rude. He says, I told you this is linked with the Imam, alayhi salam. He says, let me see the Imam, let me ask the Imam. He says, fine, you want to see him? Come with me. Said Hassan Masqat, he says, I was standing behind. He grabs the hand of this man. Najaf disappears, we're on a mountain. Dayul Ard. He says, I was on top of the mountain. I could see life underneath. There was city underneath. Then he replies and he says, he holds the feet of Gadi. He says, Gadi, take me back, please. I'm not ready. Sorry, Gadi. Gadi says, then don't say these big things. He says, who do you think you are? You're saying these big things? You're challenging? If you're not ready for the Imam, don't say these things. Mountain disappears, Najaf comes again. This is the reality, my friends. Think about yourself, inshallah, we'll go deeper tomorrow. Are we ready? If we're not ready, then you have tonight to become ready. Hur within one night became ready, my friends. You know why? He cried for who, Hussein? Your tears for Sayyid al-Shuhada are sufficient for you 
to make you ready for the coming of the Mahdi. Tonight is a night of du'a, my friends. For those people who are suffering, bring your suffering to your eyes. For those people who have family problems, many people have. The people here who have cancer, suffering from cancer, I've been told the news about that. Pray for them. May Allah cure you from the cancer. Cry for Sayyidu Shahada, believe me. Zahra will help you. Zahra will say, these people are crying for my son, Allah help them. Tonight is a big night. You know why? Because tonight Zahra comes. It's Thursday night. Remember those people who have died as well, your ancestors. Remember them tonight. Dedicate something for them. They say the most painful thing for Zahra is to hear the departure of Ali Akbar and Sayyid the Shuhada. A kafala goes. A bunch of people, they go from Iran. From Iran, they go towards Karbala. The day is a Thursday like today. Time is after Isha. They say that these people do Azadari that day. And they cry and they recite the Masaib of Ali Akbar. They say each one of them were crying loudly. In fact, in the narration it says it was as if the walls were crying, the grave of Sayyid al-Shuhada was crying. That night they went into the place of sleep, and as they slept, each one of them sees the same dream. In that dream they see Sayyid al-Shuhada coming. A message comes. O oh, people stand up, Hussein is coming. Those people got up. They were pilgrims. They said, Mala, you didn't need to come to us. We would have come to you. The reply comes, Tell every one of those people who come and see me, Know that me, Hussein, will come and see you. All you need to do is make that intention. Mala Hussein will come and see you. The second thing they say, Mala says to them, They said, You know that person in your mosque who fixes the shoes of the people? The one who fixes the shoes of the Azad? I'd like that man who's standing outside. Tell him, Send him my salam. Tell him Hussein gives his salam. Hussein is happy with him. His mother is happy with him. You know why? Because he's serving my azadar. Thirdly, he says, he says, my friend, remember, if ever it's a Thursday, if ever you're in Karbala, if ever it's my shrine, don't ever recite the Musiba of Ali Akbar because my mother comes here and she can't take it and she passes out. Today when you cry, today when you ask for your du'as, ask for the sake of Ali Akbar. Ask for the sake of that old father who was going to the grave of his young son. In the narration it says, when Hur finally comes over to the type side of Sayyid the shahada Hur says, Imam, I have one request. That request is that I want to go and fight and I want to send my son first to fight. Imam says, fine. His son goes and fights. A time comes when he falls. He says, Father, come to my help. Sayyid al-Shuhada stands up and he turns around and he says, Hur, don't go. Don't you know? An old father shouldn't go to the dead body of his son. I, Hussein, will go. This is that reality, my friends. In the narration it stated that in the Battle of Safin, when Muhammad the Hanafi was fighting, Amir al-Mu'mineen was a proud father. He was watching his son fight. When his son came back, Amir al-Mu'mineen says to him, he says, Muhammad, you must be thirsty, my son. He bought him water. He took that water. He feeds Muhammad the Hanafi himself. He puts the water on his body. He says, son, you must be hungry. You must be thirsty. You must be hot. Now look Look at the mazloom yet. We haven't even talked about Sayyid the shahada Your voices are raised. Ajrakum Allah. May Fatim accept your tears. Your voices are... You know why? Because you know what's coming. You know the mazloom yet of Hussein. They say that in the system of Sayyid the shahada whenever a baby was born to Sayyid the shahada he would take them and put him in the mahram of the Prophet. Imam Zain al Abidin was born. You know who came? He put him in the mahrab. Amir al muminin comes. He says, Allah, thank you for this ni'mat. In the narration it says, when Ali Akbar was born, he put him in the mahrab. Sayyidah Zaydab comes, picks up the child, says, Alhamdulillah, and walks off. Tarbi of Ali Akbar, Sayyidah Zainab. Time comes. That time comes, where Sayyidah Shahada standing there, Ali Akbar comes, he says, Father, I want to die. 
Say the Shahada says, he says, why don't you go to your mother and go to Sayyidah Zainab, go to your brother and ask for permission. He comes into the tent where his mother was. In the narration it stated, who raised Ali Akbar Sayyidah Zainab? I came across a particular narration to say, you know what the mother said? She said, Akbar, all of your life you've been raised by Zainab. Because <laughs> Akbar, I'll miss you a lot, my son. She goes towards this case. She sees the clothes of Akbar. She says, I was used to wait for you, Akbar, when you were a small child. I saw you develop into a young man. I was waiting for that day to come when you were going to get married. Says, today has come. Son, you're going. I know I won't see any happiness anymore. He looks up at his mother and he says, If Fatima was to say on the day of judgment, your son over her son, what would you say? She says, son, go. He gets up and he goes to the room of Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab looks up at him. says, Akbar. says, don't say anything, auntie. Just know one thing. If your mother Zahra comes tomorrow, what are you going to say? says, Akbar, go. Comes to Imam Zain al -Abidin. Starts kissing his hand and his feet. Tears start dropping. Imam gets up. He says, Akbar, why are you crying for brother? He says, don't you know? Our father is all alone. He says, where's Abbas? He says, Abbas is dead. He says, where's Qasim? He says, Qasim is dead. He continues to the final stage where Ali Akbar says, brother, other than you and me, there is no one else to help our father. And they say, Imam Zain al Abidin says, bring me my... S Walking stick, bring me my sword. I can't walk properly, but I can't see that my father is gharib today. He's where he today is thirsty. Imam says, no, for you. Imam Hussain says, for you is no shahada. For you is jihad akbar. They say, Ali Akbar comes forward. This is the part that makes Zahra cry. You know what makes her cry? The final farewell. You know what Imam Hussain says? Imam Hussain says, son, when you were younger, your mother used to tie the imam on your head. When you grew older, your aunt used to tie the imam on your head. Said, I had a wish in my heart, one day you'd get married, one day I'd tie the imam on your head. Says, son, I've always seen your aunties, I used to feel I wanted to tie the imam, but I didn't do. He says, today I ask you for one thing, son, let me tie the imam on your head. They say a young son sits down, an old father begins to tie the imama, in the same way as the Prophet tied the imama on Amir al-Mu'minin in the Battle of Khaybar, when Amir al-Mu'minin's imama was being tied, Rasulullah said, Nasr man Allahi wa fatun qareeb. At this stage, Imam Hussein says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Takes out the taht and halak like he would do for a dead body. Puts it on his son. He says, son, now go. In the narration it says, as the sons, somebody said there was a Christian narrator. He says, I was watching. As Ali Akbar's horse began to pick up speed, an old man would be running faster picking up speed. As the horses stopped, he said the old man would stop. Ali Akbar looked behind, he said, Father, why are you following me for? This old man replies, is a son. If only you had a son like mine. Everything in his life he put into his son, right? That's a father. For all of those fathers who are here, you're waiting one day your son will get older, right? I've seen fathers being more happy at the day when their son is getting married. That day will come. Imagine that now, Ali Akbar is going into the battlefield. In the narration it says, he sees that the mother of Akbar can't take it anymore. Imam Hussein says to her, the mother of Akbar, I've heard from Rasulullah, when a mother prays for a child, that comes true. She goes into the tent, she raises her hands, she said, for the sake of the one who united Ismail to Ibrahim, the one who united Yusuf to Yaqub, for the thirst of Abi Abdullah al-Hussein, return my son back to me. In the narration it says, Ali Akbar did come back. He came back and he says to his father, he says, Father, I'm thirsty. The Orafas say, it wasn't the fact that he was thirsty. It was the fact that Imam Hussein had the basira of the Imam on him. In the, in the Orafas say this. The Orafas say, as long as the Imam had the look of the Imam, nothing could touch Akbar. But Akbar was getting tired. Akbar wanted to die. He was saying to the Prophet, he was saying to the Imam, he was saying to take away your look from me so that I can go and die. You know what happens? He puts his tongue into the mouth of Hussein. It was as if Hussein gave him something spiritual. Now he begins to fight. He's a son now go. Imam Hussein takes away that basira of him. 
a person comes forward, he says, I want to do something today that's going to make Hussein cry. I want to do something today that's going to make an old father cry. In the narration it says, he took a spear. He hit the spear into the chest of Akbar. He says, let me lift up this child up over the head so that Hussein can see that I've done this. In the narration it says, the spear breaks. As the spear breaks, Ali Akbar calls out, my finally salam, my final salam, oh father. In the narration it says, a person comes blind as that he's walking on his hands and his knees. The poet says, according to the poet, it says, Imam Hussein was saying, he was saying, son, don't leave me in my loneliness. They say Hussein is coming on his hands and his knees. His eyes are gone. He's walking on the floor. He's saying, son, where are you? Son, where I can't see anything, my son. Don't leave me in this loneliness. Don't leave me to break like this. In the narration, it says, Karbala begins to shake. As Karbala begins to shake, Zainab says, looks at Sajjad. Sajjad says, mother, auntie, what is this shaking that's going on? Says, look for yourself. She removes the curtains. At this moment, Imam Zain al sees he's an old man carrying a young son on his back. As he sees this, he says, As-salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. May Allah accept our worship today for all of those people who have problems. May Allah remove those problems. May Allah forgive our sins and hasten to the whore of the Imam, Matam Hussain.